This is the specimen paper to question 1.1. We have these parallel plates and stuff going down. So we know that as soon as we see parallel plates, we're thinking electric field is equal to, well, F over Q, but it's also equal to V over D. We've been asked for the time taken to four. So therefore we're gonna use SUVAT. We know if we're just falling, acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. U is zero. S we're told is 4.5 and we're looking for the time. Don't care about that. So as per usual, we're using S equals UT plus half 80 squared. U disappears because U is zero. We're looking for the time. So rearranging this time is equal to the square root of 2S over A. So that's two times 4.5 divided by 9.8. And let's go to two sig figs, seeing that that's what our data was given to. 0 0.96 seconds. Next, we're being asked to prove that the acceleration is about 0 0.2 meters per second squared. So we're looking for A. We know that F is equal to MA from Newton's second law. And we know from above that force is equal to EQ. And we know that electric field strength is equal to V over D. So we can say that therefore MA is equal to V over D times Q. We're looking for acceleration. Therefore, rearranging this is equal to V over D times Q over M. And this is specific charge. So we can just say that's equal to 65 kilovolts, so 6.5 times 10 to the 4, divided by our separation, which we're told at the beginning is 0.35 meters, times the specific charge, which is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6. Let's tidy up powers of 10, why not? This ends up becoming minus two. So 6.5 divided by 0 0.35, and then we times that by, well, I'm just gonna say that's 0 0.012. And it gives us 0 0.22 meters per second squared. So yes, we are similar to the value they gave. Next we're being asked for the horizontal deflection. So in other words, we're gonna to have to use SUVAT again to find S going that way. U is zero horizontally, V we don't care about, A we just found is 0.22, and the time we know how long it takes, we found that earlier. So we're gonna use S equals UT plus half AT squared, UT disappears, we're looking for S this time, so that's equal to a half times 0.22, times 0 0.96 squared. And let's go to two sig figs, 0 0.10 meters, 10 centimeters. Why is time independent of mass? This is just a general question, isn't it? We know that force of gravity is equal to mg. It's a bit of circular reasoning here, but whatever. And we know as F equals ma, g is always equal to a. Therefore, a is independent of the mass. In other words, a heavier object is harder to accelerate, but it has a stronger force of gravity to achieve it. But what about horizontal acceleration? Well, we just saw earlier that A is equal to V over D times Q over M. Therefore, A is inversely proportional to the mass going sideways. Therefore, larger mass particles accelerate at slower rate. But we're being asked to give two reasons. We've dealt with M changing, but it's also very unlikely that all of the particles have the same charge too. So particles likely to have different charges, therefore experience different acceleration. 2.1, we have a capacitor that's 370 picofarads. So pico is times 10 to the minus 12. So let's say that's 3.7 times 10 to the minus 10 farads. You could also say 370 times 10 to the minus 12. Area, we're told, is 250 centimeters squared. We need to turn that into meters squared. So this is 2.5 times 10 to the 2. Centimeters to meters, we divide by 100. That's 10 to the 2. So therefore, centimeters squared to meter squared, divide by 100 squared. So that's times 10 to the minus 4. So that is so 2.5 times 10 to the minus two meters squared and we're being asked to find the separation of the plates or the thickness of the sheet same thing 
So let's crack out our equation. Capacitance is equal to area times permittive free space times relative permittivity, 2.3, divide by the separation. What we want to do is swap around capacitance and separation, so therefore equal to that. So that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 times permittivity of free space, we're told is this, times the 2.3, and then divide that by the capacitance. Tidying up powers, so this ends up becoming times 10 to the minus 14, but then the minus 10 on the bottom, that becomes plus 10 on top, so therefore this just ends up being times 10 to the minus 4. Popping that all into my calculator, that gives us 1.38 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, or in other words, one point well we better go to two sig figs seeing that that's what our data is given to so 1.4 times 10 to the minus three meters capacitor is charged so we have a pd of 35 volts the charge is 13 nanocoulombs so that's 1.3 times 10 to the minus eight coulombs 13 nanocoulombs and the energy stored is 0.23 microjoules so let's leave it like that for now i guess we're going to be talking about proportionality here the supply is disconnected okay so if the supply is disconnected that means that the charge stays the same because charge cannot leak off the plates or indeed be added and then we're told that the polythene sheet is pulled out so epsilon r is going from 2.3 down to 1 so we're being asked to find out the new PD. So you have the PD to begin with, and then we have that. Okay, so we're not concerned with energy with this one, so we don't need an equation for energy. So let's get our capacitance equation. So Q is equal to VC. Q is staying the same, so therefore we can say that PD is inversely proportional to the capacitance. We know that from earlier, capacitance is equal to all of this. What's staying the same? A and epsilon zero and D are staying the same. So we can say that capacitance is proportional to epsilon R. Therefore, V is not only proportional to one over C, but it's also proportional to one over epsilon R. So therefore we can say that V1 epsilon R1 is equal to V2 epsilon R2. We know that this ends up just being one, so that just disappears. So therefore, V2 is just going to be equal to our original voltage, our original PD, times 2.3. And sure enough, that gives us, well, we better round it to 81 volts. We're now being asked to find out what the energy is. Which equation are we going to use for energy? Well, our three equations are half QV, half CV squared, and half Q squared over C. What don't we want to use? We don't want to use this one because both C and V are changing. Whenever it comes to this, we want an equation that has a constant in it. So seeing that we know what's happening to the capacitance, let's use this one here. We know that charge is staying the same, so we can say that energy is inversely proportional to the capacitance. Like we just saw, the capacitance is proportional to epsilon R, so therefore energy is also proportional to 1 over epsilon r. So we can say energy 1 times epsilon r1 is equal to energy 2 times epsilon r2. So the same thing again, epsilon r2 disappears, so therefore the new energy is just going to be that 0 0.23 microjoules times 2.3, and sure enough that gives us 0 0.53 microjoules. Lastly, for this question, classically, we're being asked, why is there an increase in energy? Well, that is because work is required to remove the dielectric or the sheet from between the plates. And this is due to, due to the attractive electrostatic forces between the plates and the edges of the sheet. And it's worth putting, this is a result of the dipoles in the sheet, the dielectric, lining up along the field lines, therefore resulting in the top and bottom of the sheet being oppositely charged. So let's say these are our parallel plates, dielectric in between, the dipoles line up along the field lines, and then that results in the bottom of it being negatively charged 
and the top of it being positively charged so it requires energy to pull that out from between the plates kinetic theory state two assumptions about the motion of the molecules so we know that our five assumptions are these r is applicable the motion of molecules is random a attraction well it's not really to do with the motion is it really v the volume of the molecules not really that important e the collisions between the molecules are elastic d we have to assume the duration of the collisions is very short relative to the time between collisions so why does the pressure inside a football increase when the temperature of it rises volume remains constant when temp increases as does kinetic energy of molecules and sure we could give the equation there e k is equal to three hours kt therefore so does their velocity so when colliding with walls of container or walls of football collision results in greater change in momentum therefore force exerted on walls increases as does pressure so it's all about that change in momentum that's what it comes down to in the end 3.3 sticking with the football we want the circumference to be 680 millimeters and lower than 700 pressure is supposed to be between 0.6 times 10 to the 5 pascals and 1.1 it's quite a big difference actually i'm quite surprised so ultimately we're being asked to find what the new pressure is when it's inflated so we've been given the mass of air inside to begin with that's 11.4 grams but because we're given the molar mass as well of air that's 29 grams per mole we can use these to find out what the number of moles inside the football is so it's just 11.4 divided by 29 that gives us 0.393 moles cool so we're probably going to have to use pv equals nrt then seeing that we found n so we have that we're trying to find p let's find out the temperature next we know the temperature is equal to 17 degrees c but we need that in kelvin so we add on 273 that gives us 290 kelvin so we have that and last but not least we have to find the volume we're given the circumference so we know circumference is equal to pi d and that is 690 millimeters so 0 0.69 meters therefore the diameter is well if we just do 0.69 divided by pi we end up with 0 0.22 meters we can find the volume from this then volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed so that's four thirds times pi times well half the diameter so it's 0.11 cubed that gives us a value of 5.58 let's say times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed so we have everything we need now we just need to rearrange this to find the pressure so that's nrt divided by the volume so that's equal to our point 393 moles times the molar gas constant times our temperature in kelvin divided by the volume and it gives us a hundred and let's say 70 kilopascals so 1.7 times 10 to the 5 pascals we're told that it has to be between 0 0.6 and 1.1 above atmospheric pressure so if you take away that normal atmospheric pressure of 100,000 we're left with 0 0.7 times 10 to the 5 pascals so yes that does fall between our tolerances according to the law of football all right we have an ancient flask this is not an easy question but we have a half-life for starters of 14.8 hours are we going to have to turn that in two seconds we shall see but chances are we are going to have to find a decay constant so we're mixing three times 10 to the minus 10 with 1500 centimeters cubed of water then we inject only 15 centimeters cubed that's a hundredth so one hundredth of the three times 10 to the minus 10 grams so that gives us three times 10 to the minus 12 grams of this sodium 24. so we've been asked to show that about that many atoms are in there fair enough that's nice and easy we know that one mole of this sodium is equal to 
24 grams. So therefore we have three times 10 to the minus 12 grams in there. Divide that by the mass of one mole. We end up with 1.25 times 10 to the minus 13 moles having been injected. In order to turn that into number of molecules, therefore N is gonna be equal to a 1.25 times 10 to the minus 13 moles times the number of particles in one mole, that is Avogadro's constant. Let's clean up powers of 10, why not? Minus 13 and 23, so therefore this just ends up being times 10 to the 10. Yeah, this is looking good already. And that gives us 7.53. Let's go to three sig figs times 10 to the 10 atoms. Next, we're being asked to show the activity in Becquerel. So yes, we are gonna have to turn that half-life into seconds. So half-life is gonna be 14.8 times 3,600. That's gonna give us the half-life in seconds. And that gives us, let's say, well, we better go to three sig figs. So let's say 5.33 times 10 to the four seconds. Next, we know activity is equal to lambda n. And we know that lambda, that's the decay constant and the half-life are, they're inversely proportional. Log two is the conversion factor. So therefore we can say that activity is equal to log of two times n divided by the half-life. Let's do it all in one go. So we're going to do 7.53, that's our n times 10 to the 10 times log of two, divide that by our half-life. Powers of 10 again, let's take away four from the top. So we end up with that. And we end up with an activity of Nearly a million, but not quite. So nine point, let's go with five, six, 9.56 times 10 to the five Becquerel. So she waits 3.5 hours. Okay, so let's have a think about this. So the time is 3.5 hours. And then she extracts that amount, fine. And then she finds the activity, the new activity to be 3,600 Becquerel. So we've been asked to find how much volume of liquid is in the flask. So we know we're gonna to have to deal with a ratio at the end. First things first, let's find out what the activity should be. And we find that by A divided by A zero is equal to E to the minus lambda T. Therefore, the activity should be equal to A zero times E to the minus, well, we could put lambda T, but seeing that we've got a half-life, Let's use that instead. So let's replace lambda with log two times t divided by the half-life. Yes, you can find out the decay constant if you want to first, up to you. So that's equal to our 9.56 times 10 to the five Becquerel that we found earlier. And then we times that by e to the power of, put this in a bracket, log two times the time is 3.5 hours and then we can just use the half-life in hours as well makes things a little bit easier so i'm going to find the brackets first just so i don't make a mistake and then we do 9.56 times 10 to the 5 times e to the answer and that should give us an activity of 8.11 times 10 to the 5 becquerel but we're not getting that activity we're only getting this activity here. Therefore, we have to find a ratio. That liquid that has the activity of 8.11 times 10 to the five has been shared throughout the whole volume of the liquid inside the flask. And so that's 225 times as much liquid than was injected. Therefore, volume in the flask, well, we know it was 15 centimeters cubed, don't we? So we can do 15, times 225 and it gives us 3380 centimeters cubed now the mark scheme gives a higher value that's because throughout the whole question they've used rounded values in their calculations so 4.4 we're told that empty flask has a mass of 1.5 kilograms full flask has a mass of 5.2 kilograms therefore the mass of the water or I should probably say liquid, is equal to one take away the other, that gives us 3.7 kilograms. Is that right? Well, we've got here roughly 
3,400 centimeters cubed, let's say. And you should know that one centimeter cubed of water is equivalent to one gram of mass. Therefore, we can say that we have roughly 3,400 grams. So that's 3.4 kilograms. These aren't the same. Why is that? Well, we know that this conversion factor is for pure water. So the difference may be due to liquid not being pure water. 5.1 Lenz's law. How does it predict direction of current induced? We know that when switch is closed, change in current produces change in magnetic field. This induces current in Y. Lenz's law states that direction of this current is such that it opposes the current in X. Therefore, will flow in opposite direction. Currents don't like being induced. So therefore, we know it's going to be anti-clockwise. I've done it the other way around here, but it doesn't matter too much. When switch opened, current in Y switches to clockwise to counter current returning to zero in X. Okay, so we have a graph of voltage against time. So chances are we're going to have to find the time period, then the frequency. So let's have a look. One second is one and a half complete waves. So 1.5 waves in one second. Therefore, the time period is going to be two thirds. So 0 0.67 seconds. Therefore, the frequency is going to be the reciprocal. So that's three over two. So that's 1.5 hertz. Great. So we have a frequency. We're also told that the number of turns is 500 and we're told that the diameter is 35 centimeters. So therefore the area is going to be pi d squared over four. It gives us an area of 0.096 meters squared. We have a spinning coil and we have a frequency. Therefore we can crack out our equation for spinning coils. That is EMF is equal to ban omega sine or cos omega t. But we know that this bit here is equal to just the max EMF. So therefore, we can say max EMF is equal to ban omega. Omega we know is 2 pi f. We're looking for b. Therefore, b is going to be equal to our max EMF divided by a n omega, which is equal to 2 pi f, like we said. So the max voltage I can see is 5.6 microvolts, so 5.6 times 10 to the minus 6, divided by, well, let's say 9.6 times 10 to the minus 2, times 5 times 10 to the 2, because it's 500, times 2 times pi, I'm running out of space here, times 1.5. So powers of 10, that cancels with that. We know that 2 times 1.5 is 3. So this just ends up being 5.6 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 9.6 times 5 times 3 pi. And that gives us 1.24 times 10 to the minus 8 teslas. 6.1, we're told lots of information about a satellite. We know the height is equal to 12,000 kilometers. Remember that we're going to have to add that on to the radius of the Earth at some point, probably. We're given the angular speed, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 radians per second. And we're given this equation. This is actually one that you encounter in astronomy. It's not usually one that we encounter in the normal course. We're given the frequency of the radiation being 1100 megahertz. So that's 1.1 times 10 to the 9 hertz and we're told that the diameter is 1.7 meters so i've written down the information but 6.1 is just asking what are two features of an orbit for it to be geostationary first we know that the time period is equal to the period of rotation of the earth 24 hours the only place you can have a satellite being geostationary is above the equator so must be above equator. So we're being asked to find the time period. Well, we know that angular speed is equal to two pi f. So that's the same as two pi over t. So swapping around t 
and omega, we end up with the time period is equal to two pi over omega. So that's two pi divided by our 2.5 times 10 to the minus four. And well, let's go to two sig figs. That gives us 2.5 times 10 to the four seconds. Interesting. Next we're being asked to prove the beam width. This is where things get a little bit weird and a little bit just astronomy -y. So we're gonna be using this equation here. So first we have to find the wavelength. We know that V equals F lambda or C equals F lambda, whatever takes your fancy. So therefore taking F to the other side, we end up with V over F and it gives us 0.27 meters. Great, but now we have to find what this angle covered is in radians. So we take our 0.27 and we divide that by diameter of the dish. That gives us 0 0.16 radians. And this is where things fall apart a little bit. This is very much just an astronomy way of looking at things. If we have our satellite here and we're beaming with this angle of 0.16 radians, we're looking for this linear width and there's theta. We can actually approximate the width to just the distance that we are away times the angle in radians. Don't worry, this will never come up in your exam unless you're doing astronomy. So that's 12,000 kilometers. We can leave it in kilometers times that by 0.16. And that gives us a width of about 1,900 kilometers. Like I said, that'll never turn up in your exam, so don't worry about it. 6.4, so we're looking for the time taken for the satellite to pass this point. How on earth did this question end up in a normal paper? I mean, we've got the width of the beam from above, so we can say that the speed is equal to distance divided by time. So swapping these two around, we can say that time is equal to distance divided by speed, the distance in this case being the width of that beam, so 1900 kilometers. But how do we find speed? Well, we know that V is equal to omega R, so that's equal to our 2.54 times 10 to the minus four radians per second that we had at the beginning, times the radius of the Earth. We're talking about the Earth going around here, so 6.4 times 10 to the six meters. So therefore, popping that in here, we end up with 1.9 times 10 to the six meters divided by 2.54 times 10 to the minus four times 6.4 powers of 10 for the six disappear. So let's pop that in our calculator and it gives us 1,170 seconds. We're being asked for it in minutes, so therefore divide by 60. And that gives us roughly, well, 19 and a half minutes. So how would this affect the signal strength if it's moved to a higher orbit? Well, satellite is further away therefore signal is weaker, just from the inverse square law, isn't it? We can say that I is inversely proportional to the distance squared. However, the signal is received for longer because it's further away, so it has a wider beam. There we go, that's over with multiple choice. So what are the units of G squared over G? Well, we know that G is Newton's per kilogram, if we're talking in terms of Newton's, which our answers are all in. So squaring that, we end up with Newton squared per kilogram squared. Why not? Let's look up what the unit is for G. It's Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Therefore, one divided by the other leaves us with just Newtons. We end up with meters to the minus two, because there's no meters on top here, and the kilograms cancel as well. So it's just Newton's per meter squared. It's D. Planet with half the radius and a quarter of the mass. What's the field strength? Okay, so let's get our equation. G is equal to G M over R squared. Therefore, G is proportional to M over R squared. So what's happening to mass? That's going down to a quarter. The radius is halving. So therefore, this whole thing divides by four as well. So therefore divide by four on top, divide by four on the bottom, they cancel. Therefore it should be exactly the same as ours. So it should be roughly 10, so it's C. Ah, classic, here we go, two stars. We have M and 4M, and we're given the distance between them. We're looking for field strength of zero. Therefore we can say if this is planet one, this is planet two, we can say that G1 is equal to G2. 
This is the distance y here. Therefore, gm over, well, we can call that y squared. It's r squared, but let's call it y squared. That's equal to g times 4m divided by, well, this distance here. But we don't have that, so we say d minus y all squared. Obviously, our g's cancel, and our m's cancel as well. So what do we do? We square root the whole thing first. That's what people often forget. So 1 over y squared just becomes 1 over y. That's equal to 2 over d minus y. Let's swap things around. So we have all the y's on one side. Therefore, d minus y over y is equal to 2 over 1, so just 2. Therefore, d over y minus y over y, that just ends up being 1, is equal to 2. Therefore, d over y is equal to 3. So we're looking for the ratio y over d. So it's just the reciprocal. That's a third. So the answer is b. 10, which is correct about Newton's law of gravitation. So we know that is Newton's law of gravitation. So A, the origin, no, doesn't tell us where they come from. B, definitely doesn't tell us about things burning up. C, it's not that either. D, various factors affect the force between, yes, of course it's that one, isn't it? Easy peasy. 11, we have field lines and an equipotential. We know for starters that the field lines are pointing in that direction, so we know that positive charges are going to go that way, whereas negative particles will go that way. So let's have a look which one is correct. So when, let's say it's an electron, when the electron is moved to the left, the electric force decreases? No, because we can see that the lines are converging, so it's actually getting stronger. What about B? If we move it to the right, what happens to its potential energy? Well, no, that's not right, is it? Because we know that it is just going to move to the right of its own accord, so therefore gaining kinetic energy, so it's going to be the opposite. C, along PQ, potential energy, no, it's not going to change at all. It's an equipotential. Potential doesn't change, so it has to be D, but let's just check it. The magnitude of the electric force is, yes, of course, it's unchanged, isn't it? Because it's not moving anywhere. The lines are just as far apart. Yes, of course, it has to be that one, doesn't it? What's the magnitude of the force? We know that F is equal to EQ for parallel plates, and that's equal to V over D times Q. Now, I get the feeling this is a trick question. Yes, it is, because look at this. It's given us Q that's between these parallel plates, but we know that between parallel plates, force is the same everywhere. So it doesn't matter where the particle is, they're trying to catch us out. So, well, we've already done it. We know that it's just equal to VQ over D. So it's going to be B. Don't get caught out. So what is true about this particle that's heading towards this nucleus? So A is acceleration at P0. No, of course it's not. It's experiencing a force. It's experiencing acceleration. B, kinetic energy, greatest at P, of course not, because it's slowing down as it gets towards the nucleus and is being repelled by it. C, potential energy, least at P, no, because that's the same as B. So, therefore, once again, it has to be D. But let's just check if the speed is least at P. Yes, easy peasy. 14, electric potential. Okay, so we have V1 is 45. That is at R. But then we're told that it increases to 50 volts when we take R and add on another 1.5 meters. So let's check out our equation. V is equal to KQ over R. Q is staying the same. Therefore, we can say that V1 R1 equals V2 R2. But in our case, it's going to be V1 R is equal to V2 R plus 1.5. So expanding this out then, we end up with V1R. I'm just going to take away the V2R from the other side already. And that's equal to 1.5 V2. Factorizing this. Therefore, that's 5 volts times R is equal to the 1.5 times 50. So that's 75. Therefore, R is going to be 50. So the answer is D. So let's write down Coulomb's law. So F is equal to K, Q. I tell you what, I'm going to write in there 2Q because we know that's what the charge is on the other one. We don't care about the signs, just the magnitude. Divide that by D squared. What's staying the same in this situation? Well, K is staying the same. Do you know what? Q's are staying the same as well. So we basically have just 1 times 2. 
So we could say that force therefore is, you know, equal to, as it were, two over d squared. Let's see what's changing after that then. Well, we're adding a q to each, so we now have plus two q on the left, and we have minus just a q on the right. So actually, the magnitude of the forces aren't changing, so they're staying the same. So what's the only thing that's happening? We're doubling the distance. If we're doubling the distance, that means the whole thing divides by four. Therefore, it should be a quarter of its original value, so we're looking at A. Parallel plate capacitor, which is incorrect. Capacitance is the amount of charge stored when the PD is one volt. Well, we know that Q is VC, therefore capacitance is charge divided by voltage, so that is correct, so that's not our answer. B, uniform electric field, yes, we know that, parallel plates. C, charge stored is inversely proportional to the PD? Well, no, because we've just seen that they are proportional. So that's wrong, so that has to be our answer. Let's just check D. The energy stored is proportional to the square of the PD. Yes, we know that energy can be given by half, CV squared, and so that is right. So that's definitely not our answer either. So what do we have here? Data logger, blah, blah, blah. So after a time equal to the time constant, so therefore V over V zero, is equal to e to the minus t over rc, but this ends up just being then e to the minus one. And so that gives us 37%, if you remember. Therefore, voltage is going to be that original six volts times 0 0.37. And well, I can see that that's gonna give me 2.2 volts, not 3.8, but that 2.2 volts is also gonna be across the resistor because they have to have the same voltage when it's just the capacitor hooked up to the resistor. Not so when you're charging through a resistor though. How many readings then? Well, we're told a thousand readings in 10 seconds. So therefore it has to be a hundred readings per second. So we need an actual time. So we know time is the time constant that's equal to RC. So that's 500 times what's our capacitance? 10 millifarads. So 10 times 10 to the minus three. So that's five times 10 to the two times one times 10 to the minus two. So actually that just ends up being five seconds. Therefore, if we do 100 readings in one second, we can do 500 readings in five seconds. So the answer has to be D. Question 18 definitely looks like F bill to me, but we're being asked to find the mass of the wire when it floats. Therefore, we can say that MG is equal to BIL. Therefore, Mass is just equal to bill divided by G. So we're told that that's five times 10 to the minus two Teslas times the current of two amps times the length of 0 0.3 divided by 9.8. So that ends up being, if we cancel these two out, that ends up being just 0 0.1 times 0 0.3 divided by 9.8. So that's 0 0.03 divided by roughly 10, so that's three times 10 to the minus three. So I believe it has to be B. Didn't even use a calculator. And look for those shortcuts because they do quite often give you nice numbers for this very reason. Charged particle, we're looking for the frequency of rotation. Well, we know that first of all, BQV is equal to M omega squared R if we're looking for time period. And we can also say, that V is omega R. So therefore, BQ omega R equals M omega squared R. The R's cancel, one of the omegas as well. Therefore, omega is equal to BQ over M. What is omega? Angular frequency or two pi F. Therefore, moving the two pi to the other side, we see that the frequency is equal to BQ divided by two pi M. So it looks like it's going to be A. So we have a rod in a magnetic field and the rod is moved. We're looking at the side view. We know that if we move the rod just up or down, then it's not going to do anything. It does need to move horizontal sort of back into the page, doesn't it, like that. So therefore it can't be A and it can't be C. And you should know that the induced EMF is BLV. If you don't know where that comes from, have a look at my Faraday's Law video, but that's one that you really should remember. Let's put it this way, speed is distance over time. We know that induced EMF is changing flux over time, so therefore 
speed needs to be on top. So we have a pendulum and a spring that are taken down a mine. We know that these are the two equations for the pendulum and the spring respectively. The only thing that's changing is G. So if G goes down, then that means that the time period goes up. If time period goes up, then therefore frequency goes down. So frequency of the pendulum decreases, so it can't be A or C. We don't see G in the bottom equation, therefore it doesn't matter where you do this spring, it's gonna have the same frequency in space, on the moon, whatever, so therefore it has to be D. Mark scheme says C, but of course it can't be that, can it? Because, hey, if you take a pendulum up to the moon, of course it's gonna go slower. So, yeah, the Mark scheme is wrong there. So, flux linkage against time, we know that it's only when flux linkage is changing do we get an EMF induced. So which one is correct? Well, we know that if we have a graph of flux or flux linkage against time, it's the gradient that gives us the EMF. So therefore, the gradient is constant to begin with, so it has to be constant to begin with the EMF. So the only one that it can be is C. That's the only one that has a constant EMF to begin with. And then we see that it flattens out. Flux linkage isn't changing, so the EMF is zero after that. Liquid flows, electric heater, blah, blah, blah. Oh gosh, lots of things going on here. Which will increase the change in temperature with no other change? Is it A, increasing the flow rate, no, it's not going to be that, is it? Because that's going to do less. That's going to decrease the change in temperature. B, if we have a liquid with a lower specific heat capacity, well, a lower SHC means easy to heat up or easy to raise temp. So yes, that does make sense. Let's just check the other ones. C, using a higher resistance. No, because the power is going to go down for a constant voltage, that is, which it is. Higher density. No, density doesn't really change anything. It's all to do with what's happening with the SHC. 24, not an easy one, this one. We have to assume same rate of energy loss for both. So let's have a think. Equation for SHC is MC delta T. Equation for latent heat is ML. So therefore we can say in one minute, if we equate the energy for the first one to the energy of the second one, well, we can say that we had MC times two is equal to, well, it was only a 20th lost, wasn't there from the other one. So it's equal to 1 20th of L because, well, the M's cancel, don't they? Therefore we can say that the ratio of C divided by L is equal to 1 20th divided by two. So that gives us 1 40th. So the answer is A. Not an easy question that. We have volume and root mean square. So therefore we're going to get our equation. PV is equal to a third NM CRMS squared. Pressure remains constant and N. So therefore we can say that V is proportional to C squared. I'm just dropping the RMS. Therefore, if the root mean squared doubles, then that means that the volume increases by a factor of four. So the answer is D. 26, okay, this is not an easy question, but let's have a look at it. Well, we know that we have P times V for both. And so therefore, we know that just arbitrarily, well, for starters, PV equals NRT, T staying the same. So we can say that to begin with, on the left, we have two lots of P times V. Why? We also have two lots of P times V, so we end up with two. But then when the tap is opened, we now have a total volume of three. That PV from the left-hand side plus the PV from the right-hand side, that's now combined into four, but it's shared over three lots of the volume. So we can say that four is equal to three lots of PV. We're looking for P. Therefore, it goes up to four thirds. So the answer is C. Not easy, that one. 27, so we're doing beta, alpha, beta. So what happens during beta minus? The mass stays the same, but the proton number of what's left goes up by one. Same for the other one as well. But in the middle, we have minus four and minus two for the mass at the proton number. So actually, the proton number, the atomic number is staying the same, and the mass is going down by four. So let's have a look what's happening. A Actually, yes, it is an isotope because it's exactly the same atomic number. So there we go. Decay constant, is it a reciprocal? 
no, close, because it's log 2 over the half-life. So not quite a reciprocal, but inversely proportional. The rate of decay, no it's not. Constant of proportionality links half-life to the rate of decay. No, it's not that either. Constant of proportionality that links decay to the number. Of, yes, of course it does, doesn't it? Because we know it's those two things there. So it has to be D. Right. Radius of these two nuclei. So let's get out our equation. Nuclear radius is equal to R0, A to the third. We're talking about just ratio. So we can say that R is proportional to A to the third. Therefore, R1 over A1 to the third is equal to R2 by A2 to the third. And they've actually given us some really nice numbers for this one. Let's have a look. We have 1, 2, 5, and we have 64. So we shouldn't need a calculator for this. Cube root of 125 is 5. Cube root of 64 is 4. Therefore, that's equal to 1.25. The answer is B. 30, 64 days, fallen to 1 16th. So 1 16th, that is 1, 2, 3, 4 half lives. And we're told that's equal to 64 days. Therefore, one half life is 64 divided by 4. That gives us 16 days. So the answer is D. And finally, 31. Ah, yes, this question. Binding energy per nucleon. So we're given tungsten 184. If we get our graph, so it looks like this, and then we find out where 184 is, go boop, 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 and then across we find out that that's approximately something like, it's about eight, isn't it? Eight mega electron volts per nucleon. Therefore, total binding energy is equal to eight mega electron volts for just one nucleon, but then we times that by the total number of nucleons in the isotope, and we want to turn that into joules as well. So we times that by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13, because we're dealing with mega electron volts. And actually, because all of the numbers are different, I think I can just get away with doing that. And I end up with 2.3. So I reckon it has to be D. So it's 2.3 something something. And the only one that fits is D. And if you do the calculation properly, you'll find that it is 230 picojoules. But that's a little shortcut. So I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you click on the card, it'll take you to the AQA playlist where you can find the other papers. See you next time.